Good morning, guys. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I hope you had I hope you had a good weekend. It's rainy this morning, which is a good thing for my lawn. I don't have to water it tonight. So um, we are going to finish chapter four today. And uh, let me now you I know you were some of you were working on the sapling and um, reading the textbook. Any questions about anything so far? Are any questions? Remember discussion, discussion on canvas. Usually you I respond within a uh, a day, but um, I hope you respond too. Hope you respond to what your um, classmates have to say. I do have one question. I have a question about the B terms. Um, about what? Sorry. The the um, beta terms. Beta terms. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Okay. I don't exactly. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, I just don't I just don't really understand them. Can you like explain maybe the like what causes them to turn? I know that they usually occur, I think you said between proline, like with usually using the amino acid proline and I think it was glycine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do, can you just explain that just a little bit more, please? Well the um the proteins, you know, protein strands have to turn around pretty quickly, right? So especially if you have a beta sheet, you know, it has to go like this and then turn around and come back. So beta turns have to be pretty sharp. All right, and so you put some uh, some of your best amino acids at the at the turns, and some of your best amino acids are are proline because uh, the peptide bond can adopt. 100, uh, sorry, it's zero degrees um, angle. So which basically means it uh, the peptide bond can be cis. So remember we talk, looked about, we looked at the peptide bond and um, we decided that zigzag conformation was the most favorable. Was for beta turns, unfortunately it's not gonna work. Right, because um, you have to, um, there it is. Right, so zigzag is not gonna work. So you're gonna have to turn it around pretty quickly. So beta turns, beta turns. <coughs> right, that. So it has to be uh, coming this way, quickly, quickly coming back. We can't see your screen. And you cannot see my screen. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm just talking to myself, I guess. You don't see, you don't need to see my screen. You've seen it so many times already. So, all right. All right. So, um, coming this way, Four amino acids participate in the beta turn and go in exactly in the opposite direction, right? And so there's an H bond of one amino acid and a carbonyl of the of the. So this is the amino acid four, and a mass amino acid one, carbonyl of amino acid one. They will form the critical an H bond uh, hydrogen bond, and it will be going straight back. And so uh, so amino acids which it doesn't have to be, but uh, amino acids which are prevalent at beta turns are proline. And again, the idea is that it, it, uh, the peptide bond will be cis, right? And uh, cysteine and uh, glycine, the idea is that the R will be small, so it, or hydrogen, non existent, which will accommodate for this kind of um, quick beta turn and not run into any kind of 
steric hindrance issues with any anything else, right? So um, glycine. And so this is this is true for both type one and type two beta turns. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're overthinking it. Don't don't worry about it too much. You know, as long as you can uh, understand the basic things and why proline and glycine are at the in this bridge and form the part of the beta turn, I think that that's all we need to know. I mean, if you want to know more in more detail, I think you need to uh, to have like a molecular model set from OCHEM2 class and put it all together and sh and see how <coughs> how well and put the proline together and put proline instead of you know instead of proline put some other amino acid and put it in a trans conformation and see how difficult it is going to be to turn around. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, we were we were talking about various methods to assess the three-dimensional structure of proteins, and so now we were talking about um, tertiary structure. Right. So remember, we talked about secondary structure, which are alpha helices, mm -hmm. beta sheets, and beta churns, and then we started talking about three. Um, tertiary structures, how these secondary structures organize themselves within the protein. And so the two general methods which are used these days. So we talked about, uh, let's see, um, hold on a second. We talked a little bit about, maybe, maybe not. Did we talk about Circular dichroism, does it sound familiar? Circular dichroism? No. We never talked about circular dichroism? I don't think so. We stopped at intrinsically disordered proteins. We stopped at intrinsically disordered it's proteins. It's about it, uh, it's on slide 32. <coughs> So we talked about collagen. I can see that, I can see my slides. So we never talked about this? Circular dichroism, we did. Yeah, I can, I even underline these things. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. So um, circular dichroism is a classical method to do that. And I remember you use circularly polarized light. So here basically it's like a light that, um, you can polarize light in many different ways. We talked about plane polarized light in OCHEM2. You remember light in, uh, in general is not polarized. It's, it's electrical and magnetic field in all possible directions. It's if you polarize it in a specific way, uh, circularly polarized light, basically light kind of, it's almost like half a helix, right? Alpha, so basically light polarized in an alpha helix fashion uh, there are certain prisms which will allow you to do that. And um, so this will be left polarized light, left circular polarized light and the right polar circular polarized light. And this will be the extinction coefficient, which means the peptide. Now, remember I told you that um, phenylalanine and tryptophan and sorry, and tyrosine are the three most, three aromatic amino acids which absorb light to the most extent, UV light. But uh, in the absence of those, other amino acids will still absorb light, not, not so much, but a little bit. And that's due to the peptide bonds and primarily due to resonance of the, of the peptide bonds. Any kind of resonance, any kind of movement electrons 
will allow you to absorb light. Mm. So, um, and this is left polarized light, right polarized light. And you can see that uh, because peptides are chiral, right? So, uh, so the left polarized light will be absorbed to a different degree than the right polarized light. And the difference is will be the um, UACD spectrum can be negative, can be positive, right? So some of the left polarized light can be absorbed more than right polarized light or the other way around. <coughs> and obviously for the D amino acids, it's gonna be exactly the opposite, right? And so here are the curves that you would expect, right? So this is for the alpha helix. Now it can, again, imagine for D amino acids, it's gonna, exact, gonna be exactly the opposite so this is beta conformation, beta sheets, and random coil. This is just the peptide bonds, which are not organized in any kind of fashion, will absorb in this, in this fashion, right? But again, uh, keep in mind is that the tertiary structure of proteins is much more complex. It has many alpha helices, it has many beta conformations, so it's not so easy. So, so there's a big disadvantage of the classical method to, uh, to uh, determine the secondary structure and primarily is because there are many different structures in the tertiary structure of the protein. All right. So we talked about that, we talked about collagen and silk fibroin motif. And quaternary structure, now remember, so we started talking about quaternary structure. So these are multi-subunit proteins, right? So here, I think this is hemoglobin. So you can see there actually, there are a number of hemes. Hemoglobin is, the, uh, is our subject protein in chapter five. We'll talk in great detail. But there's a heme prosthetic group uh, sitting here, right? So there are four subunits <coughs> in hemoglobin. You can see there are a whole bunch of these uh, ribbons, whole bunch of these um, alpha helical structures, right? And uh, so overall, they make they make up a um, the form the structure of a globular protein, which will be water soluble. So hemoglobin, as you know, right, is a, is a water soluble protein whose function is to carry the structure, carry the oxygen throughout the tissues, pick it up in the lungs, carry it to the tissues, right, so that uh, oxygen is distributed among the tissues. And we'll talk about myoglobin, which is a simpler protein, which only has one subunit. And myoglobin's role is primarily distribution of the oxygen among the tissues in the muscle. And hemoglobin in the general um, circulation. All right, so uh, for... The, nowadays, even though X-ray crystallography is an old technique, but this is still uh, one of our main methods to determine the general structure of proteins, right? Because in principle, you can actually, uh, you get at the, at the end of this, you get a picture, you get a picture of the protein. I mean, what could be better, right? It's almost like take a photo of your protein and show it to you on your phone, right? So um, the problem with X-ray crystallography so uh, keep in mind, so for X-ray crystallography, um, so basically this is, it's a diffracted, diffracted X-ray, beam the 
diffracted X-ray beam and is diffracted by electrons. And the key word here is electron because it's diffracted by the electrons what you get at the end is electron density electron density map and as a consequence here is the, the very far in the bottom here it cannot resolve c hydrogens so remember, each, each atom in your um, structure will have uh, electrons, right? Carbon has electrons, has P electrons, S electrons, oxygen, so on and so forth, nitrogen in your, in your peptide. But hydrogens will not have any electrons on the inner shells, right? It will only has one electron to bond with something else, and that's what you will see. So you will not see hydrogens. So that's the biggest disadvantage of the X-ray crystallography is that it will give you structure which is devoid of hydrogens, devoid and you're gonna have to actually position your hydrogens, right? So what often happens is that there are all these software programs which will allow you to get the x-ray in them. You put the x-ray and they will attach the hydrogens where they're missing. Right, so, um, all right, so the steps needed. So you have to purify the protein, right? So remember for when you do, when you grow a crystal, if you have a dirty mixture with other compounds, it's very hard to grow a crystal, right? So it's much easier to grow a crystal if your compound, including the protein, is pure. And then you're gonna have to crystallize the protein. Now here is a, uh, there are certain tricks, right? So you really have, you have to be, have the skills of a, of a protein crystallographer. It's very unlikely that if you don't, if you've never grown a protein crystal, that you will be able to grow it, right? So you really know what, you, what you're doing, right? So uh, remember from OCHEM2, how would you grow a crystal? Remember some techniques? So you have a compound in this in solution. How would you grow a crystal of that compound from a solution? <clears throat> you know, the chemical principles are the same. You just have to be more careful. You just have to deal with basically realize that you're dealing with a larger molecule. So give me some tips. You have a compound in a solution and you need to grow a crystal. The solvent has to be soluble in only high temperatures. Okay, so uh, so what you're saying is the compound, you put this in the solution, in the solvent, and it's insoluble. You will heat it up, it will dissolve, and then what you, what you will do? You have to cool it down, so only what you want um, crystallizes. Okay, you cool down quickly or slowly? Slowly. And why will you cool down slowly? So that you don't get impurities in your crystals. Right, so if you cool down quickly, then the compound will not grow a crystal, it will simply precipitate, right? Remember that there's a difference between precipitation and growing a crystal. Crystal is an equilibrium process. Basically, your compound has to come in and go, come in and go. So to grow a crystal, usually crystals are very nice, beautiful, uh, solid structures, right? And crystals have very nice, beautiful shapes. 
So, uh, and the reason for that is because it's an equilibrium process, right? If you just simply cool down it very quickly, protein will precipitate quickly and you will have an amorphous, amorphous powder, not a crystal. So, uh, so you have to allow for some kind of equilibrium. So the protein has to come and go, come and go until it finds a nice, beautiful place for itself within the crystal. Right. So, um, so you will evaporate the solvent or cool down, as you said, cool it down slowly. That's another one. I just, I just give you a tip. Another one will be, uh, what? Evaporate the solvent, right? So you will decrease, you will increase the concentration of the protein within the solvent. That's another one. Can you give me a third one? So I'll uh, give you a break. What's another one? What's another tip you can uh, use to grow a crystal? So, um, increase the concentration, evaporate, cool it down. What else? How can you get a crystalline protein out of a solution? Well, think about salting out technique we talked about. You can slowly add something to your solution, right? Which will force the protein to precipitate. So if the protein has all these polar, nice polar residues on the outside, which makes it soluble, what would you add to the solvent to break up these nice polar interactions? Urea? Urea. Mm. Yeah, that could be, that could work. Yeah, so what will urea do? So it would what, unfold the protein? Well, yeah, that's the problem actually. Um, may not, maybe we shouldn't add urea because it will, uh, we don't, we want to crystallize the protein, but keep its three dimensional structure, right? Because uh, I mean, that's the whole point of the exercise. Because if you unfold the protein, then you will not capture how it works. Right, so we want it to to crystallize for X-ray, but keep its its tertiary structure intact. <clears throat> How about slowly adding some kind of non-polar solvent? How about adding some methanol? What do you think? So methanol <clears throat> will still mix with water, right? It's not going to form a second phase, but it will enter. It will with each molecule of methanol, you will add the methyl group, right? It will still mix with water, but it will start breaking up the interactions between the protein and water to a certain degree, and you just have to stop at some point and not overdo it, right? So that's another possibility. Okay. And usually what people do is, um, uh, just to give you an idea, so, um, so you have a desiccator. So desiccator is something that um, is a um, closed container where you have your protein solution in a dish, in a glass dish, for example, right? And then you have a methanol in a separate dish right next to it. So you evacuate that, right? So there's vacuum inside, which allows for the, for the methanol, which boils at lower temperature, 
to go into the atmosphere of the desiccator and slowly dissolve in your aqueous solution of the protein. And it's going to be a slow process because obviously it's going to go through the vapor, right? So methanol goes through the vapor into your water, slowly dissolving and slowly lowering the polarity of water and breaking up the polar interactions between the protein and water. So that's another technique people use. All right. Collect diffraction data. So once you have a nice crystal, usually remember you don't, it doesn't matter how many crystals you have. What matters is that you have one nice, beautiful crystal. Right? Once you have a beautiful crystal of a certain size, you can collect diffraction data, calculate electron density, and fit amino acid residues into the density, right? So then you have the density, and then you you know which amino acid has specific density. You know that from the software, the software will tell you that this is glycine, software will tell you this is valine, and so, so forth. So pros, no size limits were established, very uh, classical. Cons, why is it difficult for membrane proteins? What do you think? Membrane proteins, that means the proteins live in a membrane. So there are proteins which live in the in the cytoplasm. There are proteins which live in the membrane. Because they're non-polar. Say, say again? They're non-polar. They're non-polar. And so for non-polar proteins, they very they very they don't really form very strong bonds within each other, right? So they don't like to form nice crystals. And so membrane proteins are very sticky. They're very hydrophobic. They're kind of oily, right? So they live in the membrane. Um, and so uh, it's very hard for them to adopt a very strong tertiary structure. So in fact, many membrane proteins, for even, even now, we still have lots of membrane proteins that we're aware of, that we know that there are out there in a cell, but we still do not have their tertiary structure specifically for that reason, because they're membrane proteins. And every time somebody crystallizes a membrane protein, it's gonna be a paper in the top journal. Now, since we're talking about, what's the top journal to publish in? So you, you made a great discovery in any field. Biochemistry is one of them. You made a breakthrough discovery. You write a paper. Which journal would you send it to? Many teachers don't, don't teach that stuff, but uh, we should really um, be aware of the practical aspects. So you, you're a researcher in a lab and you made a breakthrough discovery, you just crystallized the membrane protein, yet nobody before you has ever been able to do that. You wrote a paper, which journal will you send it to? How about the one starts with an N? National Chemistry Society. Uh, what is it? Uh, what's missing here? Yes. What's missing here? Me. E. So Nature, one of the top journals. There's another one. So Nature is actually administered by the Royal Society of Chemistry. It's an English-based journal, but it's um, you know, basically, in, you know, it's European-based journal, but it's for the whole world. To publish in Nature, if you have a paper in Nature or in this journal, what am I writing here? What's missing? Come on guys, say it. There we go. So these two journals, the impact factor, you know what impact factor means? Impact factor means uh, how many times this journal has been cited in one year? Okay. So citation index. So Nature and Science have it over 30 
close to 40, which is uh, tremendous, right? So most journals, like the, your poor teacher publishes in my uh, best attempt at the Journal of the American Chemical Society, which is uh, my best journal ever to publish, has impact factor, it's called JAX, Journal of the American Chemical Society, which is a big deal. Many people never have that journal in their, on their CV. It's 13. But most people publish in journals uh, which are have lower impact factor. For example, the best journal in organic chemistry, GOC, Journal of Organic Chemistry, the impact factor is 3.5. And these are, these are very good journals, which means that uh, number of citations per, per paper, right? So let's say your um, JOC issue publishes 30, 30 papers per, per issue, right? So impact factor of 3.5 will be what's 115, 100, 110, right? 110 times, well, it will be cited 110 times per issue. So which is good. So nature and science impact factor. Now it keeps changing, but I think it's closer to 30 to 40 these days. Extremely high. So if you go into science and if you uh, manage to crystallize a membrane protein, you will publish in Nature of Science. You're the first one to do that. You get a paper with the impact factor 30 to 40. Everybody will cite you. You put it on your CV. And then when you look for a job, especially if you correspond an author in the paper, it means your primary author. People look at that and they say, oh, this guy really knows what he's doing. Nobody has ever been able to do this before him. Let's give him a job. So, um, that should be your goal. And if you get something like this done during your undergraduate years, you know, that's amazing. Get a paper, get a paper. Be before you go anywhere else, go to do research, get a paper. And even though your GPA is important, if you put a paper on your CV, that's gonna be equally as important. All right, so, uh, so these are some images for the X-ray. So um, remember, this is electron diffraction. So the X-rays will diffract from the electrons. You get something like this, and you get something like this, there's various transforms, and eventually it'll give you 3D. Now this is actually heme, heme prosthetic group with the iron inside, right? And eventually you'll get a 3D structure of a protein. So um, it's a mathematical tr transform called Fourier, Fourier very smart guy. I don't know what's going on there, but he get all these diffraction. He gets something like this and Fourier to apply Fourier transform and you get three dimensional structure of the protein. I don't know how it's done something for you to figure out if you're very much into math. And so the second technique, which uh, we'll briefly go over NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. We had that in OCHEM2, right? So again, purify, dissolve the protein. Uh, remember, dissolve the protein in a deuterated solvent because the protons will interact with the magnetic field. So you have to use deuterated solvent. In most cases, it will be D2O, right? It will be water but not H2O, it's gonna be D2O. Deuterated water, collect the more data, assign, calculate the structure. No need to crystallize the protein, can see many hydrogens. Remember with nuclear magnetic resonance, you can see hydrogens. The problem is, is that then you're dealing with insoluble proteins. So here's a situation for the membrane proteins, exactly the same thing, right? So membrane proteins will be insoluble in water. And so here's your nature paper. Right, you can get it with the X-ray. You can get it with NMR. Try to get it. Try to do your best. It works best with small proteins because there is just too many signals, 
try to interpret them all, not easy. And so what people do usually, they do two dimensional NMR. So for example, this one is NOE. I will not write this out for you, but you can Google this. It's called nuclear Oberhauser effect. Nuclear Oberhauser effect. Basically what this means is that the, uh, there is a hydrogen here, which is in position 7.0 ppm. And there's a hydrogen at position 4.0 ppm. And if you draw the lines, uh, you will find that they intercept here. So which if they intercept, what that means, if you have a signal here, and there's a nice signal here, that means that these two hydrogens are in close proximity. So nuclear overhauser effect will tell you which hydrogens are in close proximity. And this will allow you to um, deduce three-dimensional structure of proteins, close proximity. All right. So in general, um, when the proteins come off the ribosome, I already told you many times, it's gonna be uh, just a simple string, right? Unfolded, it's called nascent polypeptide. And it's gonna start to fold. It's gonna start to fold. And um, not always, but sometimes it will need proteins to help it fold, they call chaperones. Chaperones are proteins designed to help your protein to fold. Doesn't need to be all the time. Some proteins can fold by themselves. They can fold and form a native protein. Okay, so you can see here, there is a alpha helix. There's a beta confirmation. There's alpha helix, beta attached to it and so on and so forth. Uh, so for the folding intermediate, there is a remodeling, misfolded protein, bad, right? If they misfold in protein, can form oligomers, pretty bad and so on and so forth. Um, and so there is a ubiquitin proteasome system. Very important system. If you have native pep protein, if it's misfolded, right? And it cannot go back, right? Let's say the fold, the, let's say the path back is prohibited. Right, for some reason it cannot fold into its native form. Then what's gonna happen? This misfolded protein is gonna be digested by the ubiquitin proteasome system. Right, it's gonna be flagged, it's gonna be flagged as a misfolded protein. Then there's a machinery, ubiquitin machinery will bring it to proteasome. Proteasome is an organelle where a misfolded protein are chopped up into pieces, into, into amino acid fragments and <clears throat> and um, your misfolded protein is going to be digested before it does something bad. And uh, there are actually things that can do bad. Let me tell you which things it can do bad. Actually, wrote them down. Uh uh uh. Things that can do bad. Neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, let's see. Things like BSE. So misfolded. Misfolded proteins. Now you can actually Google this. I will not write this out because they have long names. BSE, anybody remembers, remembers what BSE stands for? Something with bovine, what's bovine? Bovine stands for cow, okay? So it's a disease that you can get by eating, um, by eating what? What do you Red cow disease? Red meat. Yeah, eat a uh, rare steak. And if it's not, 
If it came from BSC infected cow, you can get BSC. Then uh, there is kuru, which is related if you eat sheep. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't actually where you get kuru. In a sheep, you get scrapey. Scrapey. There is also known something known as Krusilt Jacob. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Alzheimer's also a misfolded protein disease? Right. So Alzheimer, um, so it forms this amyloid um, deposits in the brain. That's right. Correct. So it's a misfolded. So um, uh, what causes the these amyloids to form in the brain? Still not clear. So it's kind of strange that uh, we still at this point in time, we still don't know what causes that in elderly patients. But Alzheimer's is again is a, is a disease of misfolded protein. That's correct. But these ones with the one, the one that I'm writing down are infectious. Crutzfeld. Jacob. Now you obviously, obviously heard about prion proteins, right? So, so these are infectious actually proteins, which whose difference is that between all the other ones is that they can actually they misfold it by themselves, but they can help misfold other proteins as well. So they're actually the infectious agent, right? So if you get infected by prions, they can actually um, help misfold other proteins in the brain. And uh, the still the nature of these is uh, still debated. Uh, it's a highly debatable area. Um, but the word prions is something um, you should remember. So basically it stands for proteonaceous Proteonaceous infections. Proteonaceous infections. All right. So uh, in the remaining few slides, what, we, what do we have here? So protein function depends on its 3D structure. Denaturation. Remember, protein can, can be denatured by heat or cold, right? So the temperature is important. I told you, if you have high, you're running high fever, your proteins can denature pH extremes, remember pH extremes, you protonate some amino acids, deprotonate others. And what will happen? Some of them were supposed to be positively charged, negatively charged, are no longer charged. And that can lead to um, den denaturation organic solvents. All right, remember, what will organic solvents do? So if you have nice globular protein and you, ex you expose it to organic solvents, what will happen? interact with water and move the protein away? Well, they will bring out the um, hydrophobic residues from, in, from inside, right? So globular proteins, remember, the way they're structured is that they're nice polar so organic amino acids are on the outside, interacting with water, and they hide in their hydrophobic residues inside. So if you put a globular protein in our organic solvent, all these organic residues will come out to interact with the organic solvent. And basically you will break up the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And we talked about urea. Urea will break all the hydrogen bonding inside the protein, right? 
will break the hydrogen bonding. Same thing with guanidine, guanidinium hydrochloride. And you can see that usually, uh, so this is the figure showing that here, so TM is a melting point. Um, it's basically, this is the number uh, where basically, um, I think, is this like 50% to you? Yeah, I think this is the number at which 50% of the protein is unfolded. And you can see here it grows, it, it's the, the curve is pretty sharp, right? It's flat, flat, flat. And all of a sudden the first amino acid unfolds. And after that, all the other ones unfold, right? So the churn is pretty sharp. So once you unfold one amino acid, you'll unfold them all very quickly. Apomyoglobin. Apo stands for the myoglobin without the iron. Okay. Ribonuclease, a kind of the same thing. Now, uh, there's something I wanted to tell you about the ribonuclease refolding experiment. It's not nothing. It's not very um, complicated, but it has to do with this uh, solvent, mercapto ethanol. Mercapto, remember, mercapto stands for SH. Whenever you see mercapto, that means it's a self-hydryl group, which means it will break up hydrogen bonds. So this is what it will do. So if this is your uh, ribonuclease A, right? So uh, let's say there are what, 110, I mean, just over 100 amino acids. And there are these chains are linked to each other through disulfide linkages, and there are four of them, right? So there's native, it's a native state, it's catalytically active. You add urea, remember urea will break those, or you can add the mercapto ethanol, so now you break all the hydrogen, all the disulfide bonds. Now you have eight self-hydrate, self-hydrate, self-hydrol linkages, right? And then unfolded state, the sulfate cross links reduce to yield cysteine residues. But then you remove urea, mercapto ethanol, and you get it back exactly what, where you started from. So what this means is that this this protein has this propensity to form uh, this three-dimensional structure even without this, the disulfide linkages. And it just shows that this protein is kind of primed to adopt this kind of three-dimensional structure even, even though the disulfide linkages are not there, right? It's kind of disulfide linkages help. They help, they stabilize it and will keep them will keep this protein going even at higher temperatures or different pH values. But for um, functioning at normal pH, normal temperature, they're not necessarily needed, right? So, um, and so for most protein, uh, so most proteins will follow this, this kind of uh, pattern, right? So they will form on a ribosome, Let's say this one will form an antiparallel beta sheet. This segment here will form a alpha helix. This segment here will antiparallel beta sheet. This will come together to combine, to form the two secondary structures together. Now there are three secondary structures together and so on and so forth, right? So this is how, how most proteins will adopt their three-dimensional structure is that, um, primary sequence will translate into the secondary structure and the secondary structure will translate into tertiary structure, right? Pretty straightforward. And the question is, how do they, fa how do they fold so fast? There is something called Leventhal paradox. Leventhal paradox. Uh, I wanted to actually to write you something here. Let's see if I have time. Oh, no, I don't have much time. So uh, uh, I will actually, um, for the exam, I'll give you pages to read, but I will tell you right now something that I want you to know because Leventhal's paradox is very cool. Leventhal's paradox.
page one forty five. Please read about Leventhal's paradox. It's on on um, on sampling different uh, conformations of proteins, and it shows that it's highly unlikely that the protein will sample all the different conformations before it arrives at its native fold. In fact, there's a funnel, funnel involved. So basically it samples some of them a little bit, some of them in more detail, some of them in more detail, unless it arrives at something more serious. And then select few conformations will be scrutinized in much more detail down the funnel. Okay. So, so it does not sample all the different possible conformations. It's just kind of on the periphery, it kind of assesses them and decides they're no good. No good, no good, no good. Okay, this is more interesting. This is more interesting. This is more interesting. Oh, these are very interesting. Let me see which one is more, more favorable for me to perform my function. Okay. So these are known as free energy funnels for protein folding. And let's see, uh, so, uh, and there are proteins which are known as chaperones. So chaperones, so these are the proteins. So you will look at, uh, at these figures. I'm gonna give you, there's not much uh, text to read here, but um, I'll give you figures to read, uh, figure, Four thirty. Okay. Please read this figure in legend. It's not so much. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, it'll tell you that uh, that uh, chaperone heat shock protein forty and heat shock protein seventy assist the um, folding of this protein to find its native protein native form. And there's also chaperonins. Chaperonins is a different kind of proteins, which are also which also assist in in finding the protein its native fold. So this will be figure four thirty one. Please look at that. Four thirty-one, and um, and we just talked about the uh, misfolded proteins. We already mentioned that, right? Summary. So what we've done so far: we know alpha helices, we know beta sheets, we know how the properties of fibrous proteins are related. We know the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And the how proteins fold, well, no, no wonder. I told you that this is the largest unsolved puzzles in modern biochemistry. How proteins fold, how within seconds these proteins find their native fold. Guys, are there any questions about whatsoever? About anything we talked about. So this will be chapter four. And then we'll have one more chapter and the test. I hope you uh, looked at the practice test. If not, please do so quickly so that you have, you have a chance to make a comment. Make a comment so when I actually prepare the actual test, I can take into account because I already started preparing the actual test and I would like to get some feedback from you. Any questions? No? All right. Well, have a good rest of the day. Good luck with your classes. Stay healthy. Don't get sick. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Bye.